ado, I'll let Karen jump in. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? The mic? Okay, good. Mic'd up. Let me, um, let me first, oops, let me start my timer so I don't, I start talking about closure and stuff and all of a sudden I'll just lose track of time, but uh, we'll make sure. <laughs> so we're going to talk about unconventional um, programming with chemical computing, which is really cool and um, make sure I don't step in front of this too much. And I do like to tend to walk around. Uh, it's also rated G for general uh, programmers, so that's good to know. However, there is a little small warning that there will be intense sequences of Lisp code, so just be a little forewarned. It'll be okay though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the uh, main point of this talk is we're actually going to talk about some papers and uh, starring the papers by Chemical Computing by Peter Dittrich. I don't really know how to pronounce the last name, so we'll see if I do it right. Higher Order Chemical Programming Style by J.P. Banatra. And I think that's P for a day and Y. Radinick. So um, also another paper by them, Principles of Chemical Programming by the same three. And also, Programming self-organizing systems with the higher order chemical language. So these are all um, very cool papers. Uh, I will be your narrator. My name is Karen Meyer. I am GigaSquid on the internet. Uh, I am also the author of an O'Reilly book um, called Living Closure, which is a gentle introduction to the closure programming language. And I work at Cognitect along with Creighton. Uh, so prologue. Uh, I usually like to start off my talks with like a little story. So this one is no different. Uh, the little story is cutting my lawn. Uh, I live in Loveland by the Little Miami River. Uh, so we have a little bit of land, I have chickens. Uh, it's a lot of fun, except when it comes time to mow the lawn. <laughs> it's, uh, so I have to actually be out there for a few hours right around the lawnmower, which I actually enjoy. Um, I usually, it's a time where you can really unplug, either, you know, there's no internet. I can just sit and mow the lawn and like think about things, right? Uh, so I usually like to prime the pump and I just gotten this cool book on a whim. I saw it and I ordered it. Um, it's called Unconventional Programming Paradigms. And I opened up the book to the, the first chapter and there's this thing called chemical programming. And I'm like, I have no idea even what this is. Uh, so I just kind of read through the abstract and got on the lawnmower and started mowing the lawn. Now, my lawn, oh yeah. I'm sorry, you the lawn reading a book? No, 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 I, I read it before. Like, t t t yeah, no, 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 no. That would be silly, no, 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 no. Like I read it, I read it like just something to think about and then you go out. But uh, yeah, so our, our yard also has a lot of trees that are really nice, but you've got to like mow around them and duck under branches and all that. Um, and I usually wear like a big hat to keep the sun off my face. And the problem with that is when you're going under some of these branches, when your vision is kind of obscured, sometimes I misjudge, <laughs> you know, where the things are. So uh, I was riding along and I misjudged it. And hit my head a little bit and things just kind of went, you know, ow, and blank for a minute. And then, of course, I saw this like fuzz. <laughs> I mean, I, I was cool, but there was like a little fuzz going on. And I was still, I think your brain is a funny thing. I had some neurons still firing on this chemical programming and what this was. And then there was fuzz in my visual field. And all of a sudden I just looked around and I saw these dots and I thought, whoa, the grass is computing. <laughs> and I looked at the tree, and I was like, the tree is computing. And I looked at my hand, I'm like, whoa, man, I'm computing. And, and, then, and then I went inside and <laughs> got off the lawnmower for a little bit. But uh, the, the point of this is that, I mean, all things are computing all the time around us. Uh, all living things are processing information with chemical reactions, and they're doing this on the molecular level. Um, our endocrine system is doing this with our hormones throughout the body. Um, our immune system is doing this with its adapt adaptive defense. Uh, bacteria communicates through signal processing with this. 
So it's really all around us. The whole world is computing as we're speaking. So wait, you're saying, are we actually going to be programming with chemicals in this talk? So um, no, although that would be super cool. Uh, <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the, using the metaphor of molecules and reactions. So we're going to be talking about it in the abstract. So wait, you're saying, like, what am I going to get out of this talk? You ready? Here's the exciting part. I don't know! <laughs> and that is totally awesome, uh, because this talk is really about cross-fertilization. We're going to take two different fields. We're going to take computer programming, and we're going to take nature and biology, and we're going to mash them up together. And this is really important, because this is where research comes from. This is where new ideas come from, and innovation and exciting things spark from this cross-fertilization. So what really excites me is sharing these ideas and then, you know, with smart people in the room, what ideas then might inspire you? So let's talk about what this is. Um, at the heart of chemical programming is all about the reaction. Uh, and it's kind of hard to explain a different model of uh, approaching problems without comparing two that you already know. So we're going to compare two examples. We're going to compare um, traditional primes, like how you do compute primes the, the regular way that you're used to doing it, and then primes with a prime reaction. Yeah, let's step on my T here. All right, so this is closure code. <laughs> so we're like, wait, what is that language with all those parens? So this closure. Um, from the Hitchhiker's Guide to Closure, don't worry about the prens. They tend to freak people out at first, but really don't worry about it. Uh, once you get used to them and you have a good editor that lets you match them and already insert them, they kind of just go away and you don't really see them anymore. And in fact, you actually really do come to love them. And some people really regard the parens sometimes as a hug for your code. <laughs> Uh, so a little bit of that closure. It's a dynamic language. So if you want to uh, have a thing called cat, that's a string. You don't need to say that it's of a type string. It's a functional language. Um, here's an example of a, defining a function, say hello. Um, say hello takes a parameter name. And what it's going to do is just concatenate a string hello and the name. And this is how you would call the function on the parens say hello, and then molecule would give you hello molecule. Um, it's a hosted language, as Creighton was talking about. Um, it, it has interop with Java. It runs on the JVM. So if you do a class of the string molecule, you'll actually see that it, underneath it all, it's really a Java lang string. And you can interop with it and uh, call the Java method to uppercase on it, and that will work too. And it's also got support for concurrency. I'm not going to get too much into it, but um, as Creighton was talking about, it's got immutable data. It's got these things called VARs, refs, adamants, and agents that really make that work well. The cool thing is now, as you saw, there's also not only for the JVM, but also for um, JavaScript. There is ClojureScript, and it has all the same beautiful features as Clojure, but it actually interops with um, ClojureScript. So that's doing a JavaScript alert. So let's go back to this traditional primes. If you wanted to make a function to see if a number is prime, you could define a function called is prime question mark that would take an argument of n for a number. We're going to do this completely naive. Uh, you could find the possible factors by just looking at numbers from 2 up into that n and then seeing what the remainders are by looking at the mod across all those. And then you could just see if any of those were zero, and if there weren't any, then it would be prime. So if you have is prime five is true, is prime six false. Cool. So we could do a little bit more. We could generate um, all the primes up to n by creating a range of these things and just running kind of a filter function asking, is this one prime, is this one prime, is this one prime, is this one prime? 
and we can run that gen primes to 100, and we can get a list of all the primes to 100. So that's cool. I mean, it, it might be, look a little bit different in Clojure, but basically it's the same kind of familiar way that we're used to doing primes. So let's look at it modeled with chemical programming. How would this work? Well, the first thing you notice, there's balls <laughs> with numbers on them. This is because we're going to model a molecule as a number, and it's going to have a reaction. So if you have a six molecule react with a two molecule, you're going to come out with a three molecule and a two molecule. So let's see how this would work in code. So we're defining a function again, a prime reaction. Uh, this little parameter here means it's just structuring a vector coming in. It's going to have an A and a B molecule for our two molecules. We're going to look to see if A is greater than B, and if the mod of these is zero, then we're going to return A divided by B and B. Otherwise, we're going to say that they're no, they don't react at all, so we're just going to return the original molecules. So a prime reaction of 6 and 2 is going to yield 3 and 2. And a prime reaction of 5 and 2 is going to not, they're not going to do anything. So it's going to return the original ones 5 and 2. So now we need to make some molecules. So we're going to make a whole bunch of molecules from range 2 to 100. We're going to make another function that is going to mix and react these molecules. And the way that we're going to mix and react these molecules is we're just going to take this big list of molecules, we're going to um, shuffle them all up together, so they're random, total random order, and we're just going to divide them into pairs of twos so they can react with each other. Um, and then we're just going to go ahead and take that prime reaction that we just saw, and we're going to take each pair and we're going to have them just react. And then we're going to return our new list of reacted molecules. So if we run this mix reaction against our molecules and we take the first 10 results from it, we get a list of numbers. Some of them look like they might be prime. Some of them look like they might not be prime. But if we do this over and over again, let's see what happens. Let's go ahead and make another function that's going to be a reaction cycle. And what it's going to do is it's going to let us do this whole mix and react molecule cycle n times. So we're going to take a loop over these molecules and just basically do this, this mix and reaction stuff over and over again until we stop. Uh, so if we do this 100 times and we look at the first 10 molecules of it, hmm, we see a lot of twos and a five and a three, it's looking like it's getting more primes. There's some duplicates. Let's do it 10,000 times, and we're going to take a measurement of our solution. And this measurement is going to be to sort at them all and then take all the duplications out by doing a distinct. And when we do this, we do indeed come to get the primes up to 100. It was in a totally different way uh, that we normally um, do it. And this way, we'll have some advantages that we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, but first, this thing that we just did <clears throat> is called gamma. This is gamma chemical programming. And the thing about gamma chemical programming has some sort of themes to it. It has reaction rules on multi-sets of elements. A reaction is formed of two parts, a condition and an action. Uh, you have an execution where you take the, uh, you react it and then you replace it with the result elements. And this is the tricky part now. The result is a solution when it gets to a steady state. <laughs> so trying to figure that out is, is uh, not trivial. But we can look at another example. So we can not only calculate primes like this, but we can calculate something else like a max. Uh, by, we, see, so 6 and 2 can react with a max reaction, and it would just take the, the biggest one and return both of them, so 6 and 6. Um, let's go ahead and see this in a demo. Oh, so this is also using um, core async and closure script with fig wheel as well. See, I didn't know this would like work so well, these two talks together. <laughs> it just happened. 
So um, let me make this a bit bigger. Um, boop. Make my screen a little bit bigger here. Okay, let's look at the small max example. Okay, so you have two balls, a two and a 20, and they bump together, and they have two 20s. So that's pretty cool, right? But let's actually make more. Oh, just a word about this, this re re representation. So we talked about things and just numbers before. This is just for visualization. I'm putting it in the 2D D plane, but they're still just doing the same thing. It just makes a cooler visualization. So let's calculate the max of 100 doing this. You can kind of see our measurement down here at the bottom. Um, they're kind of cool, they're all turning the same color, so you see some like 97s all grouping together. Uh, 96s, 96s, 97s, the answer's going down, converging, 97s, 99s, all right, 99s are green. What's that straight 89 doing there? <laughs> All right, oh, it's getting closer. Come on. Man, that 96. <laughs> it's like stubborn. Oh, there it goes. Couple 97s. Yay, woo, we found the maximum. Up to 99, so, so this is, this is a kind of a cool and really interesting way to do computation. Um, and when I first put this visualization together, I would just sit here and like watch it all the time. I'd be like, let's calculate more stuff. And we can also do um, primes. So we can calculate primes this way too. It takes a little bit longer than the, the max, so I probably won't let it go, but you can kind of see, um, you can see it moving along with the answer there as it's converging. So cool stuff. All the little molecules running around. <laughs> okay, let's get back to here. Okay, so I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, what if we made the reaction functions molecules too? Because we had just like hard coded how these molecules were going to react before but we could not only make molecules of these numbers, we could make molecules of functions. And how cool would that be? So how would this work? So modeled out, we'd have a six molecule and a function molecule, and the function, it would determine on the, on the arity of the function how many parameters it would take, but it would capture molecules. So if we were talking about a function that had two parameters and it reacted with a six, and it hadn't captured anything yet, it would capture it. And then you've now got a new molecule, which is a function molecule with a captured molecule, and it encounters another molecule, and if it has an arity for it, then it'll capture that too, and turn into an even bigger molecule with two captured molecules. And then, so what happens if the arity is satisfied and the function can actually execute? it does something called hatching. And I didn't make up this term. It's actually in the paper. It hatches. It hatches out, applies the function to these captured molecules, and spits out two more molecules, the result molecules, along with it keeps itself around so it can interact with more molecules as well. So let's look at how the prime reaction would work with this sort of um, situation. So this this code would be then encapsulated in this function molecule. It would take two arguments, the A and the B, and other than that, the code looks pretty much the same. Um, it's going to return um, you know, the, the prime reaction if it actually can react with it, otherwise it's gonna return the two unchanged. Uh, the max reaction in its function molecule form is gonna look pretty much the same. You have A and B. If A is greater than B, you're gonna return two A's. Other than that, you're gonna return A and B. So how does this look with the max when we're doing it in the, the molecule form? You have a function that is, that's the maximum function that's captured a 10 and a four. It's gonna hatch out. It's gonna keep that function around there and it's gonna return two 10s. 
Um, the interesting thing about this is you can actually control the solution set size by the reaction function. So um, in all of our other examples, we were taking in two molecules and returning two molecules, and it was keeping it steady, steady state. If we change that, we could actually make the solution smaller as it would go along. We could make a reducing reaction function. So how this would be changed in the max is if you take in two molecules, and then you would just return the A instead of returning two A's. Um, so how would that look? You take in the, the two molecules there, you apply the function, and it would just return the 10 for the max. The problem I ran into this when I was doing my um, simulations was that I had less molecules and they wouldn't bounce into each other. So I was like sitting there going, are you ever going to bounce into each other? Like it just, you know, that's it's kind of hard. So I added a little extra stuff that's not in the papers where I allowed some more stirring. So I allowed the functions to exchange captured value, values. So if the functions are, here is a better example. So if you have two functions, function two has a captured molecule and it bumps into function one, then it can just exchange. And that just allows us to stir a little bit more um, so things don't get stuck. Do they have an equal affinity? Like does, I, I'm thinking of this in terms of enzymes. Huh? Like oh, cool. So um, on your last slide, oh, okay. where It, it's equal in the way I coded it. It's got no preference. Um, so yeah, so let's see a demo of this. Uh, so let's make this a little bit bigger. And we'll see a, the max example with higher order. So there's a function molecule now and the 20 and a 2. And I think the 20 is going to run into it first. We'll see. But then it'll capture it and it'll get fatter. And then it's going to capture that one. And I captured it again right away, of course. <laughs> but um, it's kind of random. But um, it, it, it'll like spit them out sometimes, too. But let's go ahead and see what this looks like. Um, I'm only doing it to 50 because with the function molecules in there, it gets a little crowded otherwise on my screen. But you can see them it like explode and as they hatch out and interact with each other. It moves a little bit slower than the other example just because you have to wait for the function molecules to run around a capture tube before you get a reaction. But you can see it is on the bottom um, moving down and converging um, to the answer. And this is also a reducing one. So the, 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 the solution is getting a little bit smaller. So if you have two Mm -hmm. a, a value, right. will, will they both swap if they bump into each other, or will they eject one? Mm, uh, they won't eject. I think they both swap. I'd have to look at the code, though. Um, I don't really remember. <laughs> oh, no, no, no problem. Um, all right. So cool. Oh, we can see that the max of 100, that doesn't, that's a little bit more when they don't reduce. So you get to see a little bit more action going on here. But yeah, fun stuff. Let's go back to here again. Okay, so what we've seen into the, through these examples is one of the really cool features about modeling computation this way is that there's no sequential processing. Things are just moving around randomly, they're interacting with things randomly, and when you take this sequentiality out of it, you can really do things concurrently. So that's like a really cool point because it, it's, it's a powerful tool that we need to use today. Um, in fact, chemical programming, this model can be applied to traditional concurrent problems uh, quite well and easily. Uh, one example, has anybody heard of the dining philosophers here? Yeah, okay. So um, for, for those who haven't heard about it or um, have heard of a different model, so these, I can't draw either. So this is my, <laughs> I think they're shapes. The circles are supposed to be philosophers and they're all sitting around at a table. On either side of them, depending on what you've heard, 
are either chopsticks or forks. I prefer the fork example, so they're forks, even though I can't draw and they look like chopsticks. The chopsticks uh, works well for you too. Yeah, <laughs> so there, there, there you go. But in my case, they're forks, even though they look like chopsticks. But, uh, so a philosopher can eat if he has a fork available on either, either side, uh, then they become an eating philosopher. If you have, if you're a philosopher and you're sitting down and you have no forks or only one fork, you must be a thinking philosopher. Uh, so you can only turn into uh, a eating philosopher when you have the two forks available. So it's, it's the concurrent problem here. So uh, how do we model this with chemical programming? With molecules, of course. So the TP is a thinking philosopher and the two molecules there are the forks, and then there's an eating molecule. So when a thinking philosopher with two forks interacts with an eating molecule, it turns into an eating philosopher molecule. When an eating philosopher molecule reacts with a think molecule, it turns into a thinking philosopher with two forks. So let's see it. Da, 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 da. Oops, make it a little smaller here. Let me restart it here. Okay, so uh, on the bottom here, you'll see the, the philosophers. I didn't do a circle because I said I'm bad at graphics. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's in a line, so it's not exactly the same, but uh, you do get some of the, sort of the same interactions. There's eating philosophers in yellow, there's sinking philosophers in blue, there's the forks on either side of them in uh, pink forks, and there, there are the think and eating molecules going up and down, interacting with them randomly. So there you go. I spent a lot of time also looking at this. <laughs> I considered putting it up as my um, screensaver. All right. So other the cool properties of um, these sorts of systems is they can also be self-organizing. Uh, when you have these simple behaviors, we can combine them to actually create pretty complex systems. Um, we see this in nature, like ant colonies. Uh, bees are a good example. And the other classic example we all know for self-organizing systems are uh, mail systems. Okay, we'll, we'll, we will see that. <laughs> so how would we design a chemical programming self-organizing mail system? Well, we start off with molecules. These are two in-mailbox molecules. There's one mailbox uh, for the A system, and the, there's one in-mailbox for the B system. There's a mail message molecule there in pink, B1, and then there's a network molecule in the middle. There is a server A molecule and a server B molecule. And this is kind of new. These are membranes. Membranes serve to keep solutions in one particular area, and they can only move into other solutions in a specified way through reaction. The membranes are just made up of other molecules, but they do not react with anything. So if this male molecule message for the B1 male server bumps into a membrane, there is no reaction. It just continues on its way. If it then goes ahead and it bumps into the A1 mailbox, no reaction because it's not destined for that one, it's a B1. If it goes and it bumps into the server A molecule, there is a reaction. Very simple one. It'll either move it on this side of the, keep it on this side of the membrane or move it over to the other side of the membrane. Okay, moved over there. Keeps on its route goes in with the network molecule. Again, very simple reaction. Either keeps it on this side of the membrane or the other side of the membrane. Routes it through. Again, we're, we're getting closer here. Continues on its merry way. Reacts with the B mail server. Routes it through again. And then finally, mail is received. 
Um, not quite yet. Oh, well, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and do it. Um, so self-healing. So we, we've seen that it's self-organized, but it can also do self-healing, which is really cool too. Um, so these simple behaviors can also create very resilient systems. We are going to introduce a crash molecule here to crash our server. It's going to randomly go around just like, you know, you're on vacation or whatever, and the server crashes randomly, right? <laughs> it goes down. And it becomes an inactive server molecule. But that's OK, because we also have a sentinel fix molecule that's patrolling the area. And when he randomly bumps into it, it has a reaction and repairs the server with an inactive molecule. So everything's very happy again. So let's actually see it. Mm -hmm. Make this bigger. Yeah, maybe that's bigger. All right, so we're starting off here. There's some B1 mail messages and some A1 or A mail messages. Uh, those are the A mailboxes over there and the B mailboxes. Uh, oh, one's already crashed. There's a lot going on here. <laughs> one's already crashed. Oh, there's another one crashed. Uh, the mail is. Oh, there's a B, B, a couple B's got over the B server here. You see it in the bottom? Look, that's mail messages being received. The A2 mailbox got one message in. The A1 mailbox got another message in. B1 got in there. Oh, there's a crash still happening around there. Oh, how did our fix guy get all the way over there? My membranes suck. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, that's a bug there. He was supposed to stay over there, but somehow he snuck up over on the other side. But anyway, you get the idea. Um, yes. I probably could. We should like hang out some more together. <laughs> so summary. Um, chemical programming is all about reactions. Um, the reaction rules are simple and elegant. It really breaks things down to the core of what's happening. Um, this is the important takeaway, I think, that reactions eliminate incidental sequentiality. Uh, again, we were talking about mutability, how you just live in that world and you just don't even see it. I think the same is for the sequentiality. I mean, how often do we just make you know, this ordered thing and loop through things in a certain order over and over again? Do we even need to do that? Do we even think about it? Most of the time, I don't. But when you take away that sequentiality, you can really just turn concurrency up to the max. And that can be a really important tool in uh, certain problem spaces. And also that these simple behaviors can build on themselves and really build robust systems that can be self-organizing and self-healing. So in closing, nature really knows what it's doing. Um, you know, we should think about it some more <laughs> and be inspired by it. So um, I have a GitHub repo that's got this code and um, you know, write up on it. So if you're interested in looking at it or looking up any of the papers, you can get links there. And that's it. Any questions? Excellent. I for totally forgot to say about this. No. <laughs> because I, I had, I had like read all these papers, like did all this, and I actually emailed one of the authors of the papers. I'm like, hey, you don't know me, but <laughs> I think this stuff is really cool. Is there any real world applications? And he said no. So this is actually very exciting because it's like an open field, right? I mean, there's been tons of research, but there's no um, concrete thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Yeah. It, it kind of reminds me of um, the things they've been doing on Twitch, 
where they have people <laughs> randomly typing into the chat room. Yeah. And, you know, uh, play Pokemon and <laughs> yes. install Windows. Um, and, you know, they had a goldfish swimming around. And yep. when the goldfish went into random corner, uh, coordinates in the uh, fishbowl, it would trigger different actions. And, really? Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, and, yeah, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's kind of this, this randomized interaction yeah. type of thing. That's cool. So, I should I mean, check out Twitch more, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Nice, okay, cool. So yeah. this, this reminds me a lot of the um, organic programming concept. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it, it feels almost like a subset of that, actually. Um, and there actually are practical applications of that that have already done, including self-driving cars being started off by that concept. Oh, wow, okay. Um, where, where basically you don't program it, mm. it programs itself based on what a real driver was doing. Like it, was, it was comparing its own programming. It would just cool. randomly generate programs. Nice. Right? And, and uh -huh. start trying to get kind of like that closer uh -huh. and closer to what they, they actually, uh, Stanford, had a professional driver get in the car. Uh -huh. And they had all this data coming in from the outside. Yeah. And they had the computer saying, okay, here's what I think I would do. And if it was different than you know what the, the actual driver was doing, uh -huh. then it would start trying to adjust its programming uh -huh. until it was in line with the professional driver. So that was basically how that finally ended up happening. Cool. Once I did that. Cool. Now is that genetic programming or is that something else? Yeah, so organic, yeah, okay. genetic, and uh, yeah. evolutionary. Evolutionary. You know, mm. All different names for essentially the same concept. Yeah. Which is basically self self development program. So this just kind of reminds me of that yeah. concept. To me what I what I kind of envision in the future is that we'll we'll end up having languages where instead of writing code, we're writing unit tests mm -hmm. and we're saying go and then yeah. the unit test pass. And just keeps randomizing until all the unit tests pass. And then it'll probably have certain mm -hmm. factors of, okay, these are things that it has to do, and then these are factors that are, you know, it's better if it has mm -hmm. more of this, or, you know, if it's bigger, smaller, whatever, faster, you know, those things mm -hmm. will just be, you know. Yeah, so that, that's a, like a this fit. This wins, this wins more, you know. Yeah, that's like a fitness function. That's yeah. one of the things that um, kind of, they're both inspired by nature, the um, genetic programming and this chemical programming. But this doesn't have a fitness function yeah. driving it, um, telling it what's better to evolve towards or anything. Or it doesn't actually have a, an evolution either, but that's another difference. But um, yeah, so this is just kind of just random okay. <laughs> doing the thing. But yeah, that's, but nature inspired too. Any, anything else? Yeah. Could it be used or applied to solve problems where you don't have like a, a known solution or algorithm ahead of time? Like that's an interesting question. I'd have to think about that. Um, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, it's interesting to think about. So, what was some of the other I'm so, oh, well, you want to see the other chapters in the book? Yeah, I should have brought the book with me. Um, I don't have it, but uh, yeah, the the first chapter is like, and it's, it's a selection of papers. It's a Springer book. And Springer books are fabulously expensive. Um, <laughs> so, but they're, they're good, they're, they're good. And, and if you actually look through the index, there's a lot of papers that you can find for free um, by just looking at the index of the papers. But where Springer really is, excels at bringing together some really um, influential papers and putting them in one spot. So that's what you're paying for. But anyway, the first chapter is like, quantum computing, and then it's chemical programming, and then it's, um, well, they have a section for genetic programming, and then there is some weird thing that I even forget the name of. It has to, oh, amorphous, amorphous computing or something like that. So I haven't even dug into the surface of the other sections, but um, it's a fabulous, you know, thing that you just want to, like, take it up a level and be like, I want to think about things a totally different way. Anything else? Okay, great.